We will move on to our next lecture. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Joseph Alcamo. Uh, Joseph will be talking about climate change and the future of water. Uh, let me introduce Joseph. Uh, Joseph Alcamo is a professor of environmental system science and is the director of the Sussex Sustainability Research Program at the University of Sussex in the UK. Over his long career, he has spearheaded research in global modeling of the environment, integrative assessment modeling, climate impact research, global water research, and environmental scenario analysis. He was co-founder of two of the largest global change research alliances, Earth System Science Partnership and Future Earth. He was co-founder and co-chair of the first global water research program of the international research community. This was the Global Water Systems Pro Project. And then from 2009 to 2013, he served as the first chief scientist of the United Nations Environment Program. He has received several awards for his achievements in global change research. Thank you very much, Joe, and over to you to share your screen. Thank you. Let's see what happens. Yeah, no, it uh, looks good so far. Really? Okay. Great, thank you. Always a good sign. Welcome to everyone. That was a great lecture, Bob. Again, you reminded me of some stuff, but I learned some more new stuff. Always good to listen to his lectures. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now we have to talk about yet another huge topic that uh, perhaps uh, we'd rather not spend the time after worrying about all the problems going on in the world already. But indeed, yes, climate change will also have a big impact on freshwater resources. And it's important, first of all, to know what to anticipate so that we can prepare for it. Let's start with the big picture, about the biggest picture you can imagine without leaving the planet, and that is the global water system. And this is a very simplified diagram of the global water system, which I'm trying to arrange my screen, pardon me, just a second, so I can gain a little space on my screen so I can see my slides. Ah, yes, perfect. So this is, this portrays the global water cycle and it being a cycle, it really doesn't matter uh, where you begin to talk about it. But let's begin with the sun, which is actually the, provides the power to enact and carry out the whole water cycle. Uh, it does this by, first of all, by stimulating evaporation of the global seas. Uh, that's this component here and it has a 425 as a number next to it. So the units here, you see in the lower right, are a thousand cubic kilometers per year, a lot of water. So a uh, thousand cubic kilometers per year is about one quarter of all of the uh, water withdrawals in an entire year from everyone, from every sector, from every livestock using water, et cetera, et cetera. It's a big number. So about 425,000 cubic kilometers of water is evaporated each year from the oceans. It's compensated by about 385,000 cubic kilometers of precipitation. That leaves around 40 uh, cubic kilometers, which is transported in the atmosphere to land surfaces. So this 40 cubic kilometers per year, if you add in the evaporation and transpiration from land surfaces, that adds up to about 111,000 cubic kilometers of precipitation coming down on the land surfaces around the earth. <clears throat> now, if you subtract out the evaporation coming from these land surfaces, that leaves around 40,000 cubic kilometers of water that makes up the entire freshwater system in the entire world. And that's the 40,000 that returns to the oceans, closing the cycle. I explain that just so that you can see what are the main actors here, which I'll talk about now, and where the freshwater system fits into the entire climate system of the earth. And you can see that as precipitation and as evaporation cha is changed in the world, you can see it will have a subtle and not so subtle effect then on this 40,000 cubic uh, kilometers of water that is left over after precipitation, uh, after uh, evaporation is subtracted from precipitation, and we have surface freshwater. 
So what are the main actors now in the global water cycle? Well, on one hand, we have precipitation, and that's precipitation in all of its forms. That's hail and snow, not only rainfall. And we have evapotranspiration, which is made up of two words and it's two components. The first one is evaporation, which occurs not only from the ground surface, but actually from the upper groundwater table around the world. So that is evaporation and transpiration. That's the amount of water that is taken up by plants around the world through their root systems. Most plants take it up through their root systems and then co conducted out um, from their pores to the atmosphere, evapotranspiration. And these two actors, precipitation and evapotranspiration, form the crux of the soil moisture balance in the world, which plays an important role in runoff. And again, is a way of simplifying or of trying to understand in a fairly simple way of how then climate changes are going to affect river flow and surface runoff. So the main source of water in the soil is precipitation, doesn't surprise anyone. And the main one of the main sinks is actual evapotranspiration. Now, that's not actual in the sense that phony is its opposite, but what compares to actual evapotranspiration is the potential evapotranspiration. So what it means is that evapotranspiration will not really occur unless two conditions are fulfilled. First of all, there has to be potential. You have to have warmer temperatures, a lot of solar radiation, but that's uh, necessary but insufficient if your um, soil environment is very dry, then you can have an enormous potential of evapotranspiration, as you do in the desert, in the, in the tropics, but you will not have actual evapotranspiration because there's no water to be evaporated. So also the soil water content has to be of a certain level together with the potential of evapotranspiration, the two conditions to actually lead to evapotranspiration. Now, if you're adding water to the soil by precipitation, losing it through evapotranspiration, and if you have a difference, if you have an excess, then you will get runoff which is a term that's used in different ways. Here I'm using it to mean the sum of the water that runs over the surface, land surface, together with the amount of water that is recharged uh, continuously into groundwater. So how much of, these, of this potential of evapotranspiration, how much of these changes in precipitation do we expect? So this is a kind of the standard presentation. It's a little, a little bit old, but the, the latest information is quite close to this. Uh, what you see in the upper two diagrams show the change in average surface temperature as a composite of, of results from several different climate models. And it shows the increase in surface temperatures up to the end of this century relative to a base period from the 1980s on. And below you see uh, the changes in precipitation. On the left, you see a, um, a scenario that we hope we will stay within. Actually, it, it um, this scenario corresponds to a global increase of around two degrees. We're still trying to stay within one and a half. We'll see how that works out. Uh, but in any event, it's a lower climate scenario. And on the right, you have a kind of an upper level climate scenario that globally will end up with uh, temperature increases of four and a half or five degrees in that order. Oh, I just wanted to point out that the patterns are different between the oceans and the surface areas for temperature, that you see a very distinct pattern where you get a lot larger warmer. So if you look at the scale down here, this yellowish color on the continents indicates a temperature increase of around two or two and a half degrees, whereas for the oceans, it might be one or one and a half degrees. There's two major factors for that. First of all, the oceans, are a fabulous storage reservoir for heat. So they differentially store the heat that's uh, building up in the atmosphere. And secondly, as I pointed out in uh, the big picture diagram, and that is that there's a lot of evaporation going on. You know, evaporation is a cooling mechanism. So for those basic reasons, you tend to get more, a greater temperature increase on land surfaces than over the ocean. Down Below here, you see in this precipitation diagram that there's much more irregular precipitation patterns around the world. And that's because you have much more local effects. Mountains have a local influence on precipitation patterns. The um, sea land surface interfaces have a, a local influence on precipitation patterns, etc. So you get a, a much more mixed pattern. This is just to give you the, the background of the kind of temperature changes, which is going to be changing evaporation and transpiration, and the precipitation changes that will be affecting river flows now. Now models 
So what are the basic processes then that are going on this link between climate and river, river flow or surface runoff? So logically speaking, in areas where there's increasing precipitation, we expect a tendency for increasing runoff and we expect a tendency for, for an increase in river flow. Again, where runoff we're talking about here is a combination of, of the surface flow together with the groundwater recharge. If you have decreasing precipitation, it's logical that also you expect decreasing runoff and a decreasing river flow. If you have increasing surface air temperatures, which are occurring virtually everywhere on Earth, then you expect a higher rate of evapotranspiration. If, as I pointed out, if the soil moisture is sufficient, you'll get a decreasing runoff and you'll get a decreasing river flow. So these are just the basic facts of life when it comes to climate impacts and the water cycle. Then we have the complicating factor. Now, we, in some places, we're going to have increasing precipitation, in some cases, decreasing. Well, what if we have increasing precipitation which is adding to the soil moisture budget I was talking about, but also increasing temperature and evapotranspiration, which is occurring almost everywhere. Then depending on their balance, the subtle balance, you will have either increasing or decreasing runoff, and you'll have increasing or decreasing river flow. So things get complicated. And that's why you need mathematical models, or at least that's why some people believe you need mathematical models in order to tie together all of those factors together to try and get a big picture and the pattern. So this is a diagram that shows uh, not the changes in extreme events under climate change, uh, floods or, or droughts. We'll get to those in a moment. But this is the average runoff under climate change. And it's for uh, a lower scenario, lower climate scenario. And again, it's showing uh, two degrees above uh, a baseline climate. The uh, bluish colors, you can look at the scale down here, the bluish colors indicate an increase in average runoff. And this seems to, this comes up in continuously in the models that the higher latitudes are showing an overall increase now in average surface runoff. And um, the yellow to orange colors indicate a decrease in average runoff. And you see large scale patterns in, in the dry topics for, uh, tropics, for example. You tend to get uh, from these models an estimate of decreasing average runoff. Also in Southern Europe and around the Mediterranean, some areas have consistently come out as areas of decreasing runoff. Another thing I wanna point out is that this is a cleverly put together map. I did not put it together, but colleagues in IPCC did put it together. And the intensity of the colors also indicate the relative agreement of the models. So you see a lot of kind of hazy colors, light yellows and very light blues, where the models don't agree whether there's average runoff, uh, an increase or decrease in average runoff. But then you can see the robust areas like you see in the upper latitudes here, where the models agree quite well that there's an increase in surface runoff. Just to remind you that this is these assertions, we're getting more and more evidence now from actual measurements, now that we have a long time series and that we've lived in an era of um, climate change up to now. But still we're reliant on on really understanding the full impacts of climate change on the models. And we have to remember that they are uncertain. But now we're not only concerned about these average changes, but of course we're concerned about changes that are gonna to lead to real damage and, and danger lives. We're concerned about floods and the frequency of floods and the effect of climate on them. And there'll be then, if, if you want to make a reasonable assessment of the impact of climate change and flood processes, you have to include a lot of different factors. One factor is that the intensity of a flood and even its duration to an extent depends on the amount of rainfall or precipitation, its intensity, its distribution across a catchment. It depends on the, the conditions in a catchment before the heavy rainfall occurs. If there's been several dry days before, then the soil will have a higher capacity to absorb rainfall. If it's been a very moist few days before, then soil moisture will be at capacity and further additional rainfall and heavy rainfall will tend to run off rather than be absorbed by the soil. Depends on the ground cover. We all know that, that if it's a vegetated, if it's trees, grassland, etc., will absorb, will tend to absorb much more uh, precipitation 
than if you have a sealed surface of a city, for example. It depends on the topography, where steep slopes will, uh, again, uh, lead to fast runoff, which will not allow much of an opportunity for the soil to absorb the precipitation. And it depends on if you're in a tidal river like the Hudson River or uh, the Thames River, then it also depends on tidal influences. Uh, uh, a few years ago, I had pleasure of visiting a, a lodge in a couple of hundred kilometers, um, no, it was about 150 kilometers north of New York City, enjoying myself very much. Uh, there was some heavy rainfall um, upstream some several kilometers, and I'm just enjoying the view of the Hudson. And uh, as the tide hits a peak, as I'm standing there watching it, the Hudson River starts pouring over the seawall unexpectedly. So their tidal influences can also play much uh, a very important role in the occurrence of floods. Now, when we talk about floods, it's 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 tough to summarize all of the information about it. So we use some kind of aggregated concepts. And one concept we use is the idea of a return period. And, and a return period is basically asked the question, how often is a particularly high and dangerous um, flood uh, discharge going to occur? And it's typical uh, to focus in on return periods, for example, the 100-year flood. Uh, why do we do that? Because in designing infrastructure, the, uh, the elevation of uh, streets above sea level, uh, the offsets of buildings from um, a riverfront, uh, the heights of bridges. In order to design this infrastructure, it's often used a hundred year return period. The hundred year flood is used as a kind of a design flood as the civil engineers call it. So it's of interest to us. It's just a reference point and it's an arbitrary reference point, but still it's an interesting relevant reference point to judge whether future uh, flood frequency as affected by climate change will be getting worse or better. So here's a diagram of a higher end climate scenario which portrays globally the changes, the estimated changes in the return period of the hundred year flood discharge under this higher end climate scenario. And if you look at the scale down here below, this, these yellowish colors, as you see here for a good part of Eastern Europe into Asia, as well as parts of North America, indi indicates that the return period of this 100 year flood might be 120 years or 140 years based on the scenario, based on the temperature increases, which are leading to higher evapotranspiration and um, according to the scenarios, which are indicating a decrease in precipitation in some of these areas. So also the occurrence of the 100 year flood may become less frequent. Now the bluish areas, which you see occupy all of the other parts uh, of the continents indicate that these blue colors indicate, as you can see by the scale, an increasing frequency. These dark blues indicate that the 100 year flood and the flood discharge associated with this one in 100 year occurrence in a particular catchment may be occurring in these dark blue areas of between five and 25 years. So the kind of thing that we are anticipating for as really being an outlier that maybe only our children will see, well, the bad news is that maybe we'll be experiencing it maybe a few times in our lifetime. So this is a way, again, of trying to get an overview of what the consequences of climate change are. I want to present these global pictures to convey the message is the strong message that we are all in this together. Now, you can see a look at a similar kind of picture for the occurrence of drought. Now, here we're not looking at river discharge, but we're actually looking at a drought indicator, which is based on soil moisture. Again, it comes up with soil moisture as playing a key role in runoff and river flow. So using this, this drought indicator, it's called the standardized precipitation evapotranspiration index. The researchers then assessed whether a 50 year drought in this case, not a hundred, like a hundred year return period of the flood. Now we're looking at a 50 year return period. How frequent would this 50 year drought, which is a 50 year drought according to current climate conditions, which is a little bit problematic because climate is changing, but Climatologists work it out. So this current 50-year drought 
How frequent will it occur in the future? Well, now here you're seeing in the high northern latitudes again, you have a kind of a consistent picture from which you've seen already. And that is that the models are, are, ex are expecting um, increased precipitation in this area. And sure enough, um, if you look at the scale, the return period of the 50 year drought in these areas, according to these models, um, is, are expected to increase to 60 or maybe 80 years. Okay, so this very severe drought could become less frequent in these northern areas and, par and parts of the other continents. The remaining area, however, if you look at the scale, this yellow to orange indicates a decreasing return period, indicating that for much of these orangish areas that you see here, that you might have a return period of the current 50 year drought that in the future, in the, towards the end of this century, if you look over a longer statistical period, you would statistically see a much more frequent occurrence of this severe drought. Now, I've been talking about the occurrence uh, and the extent and the intensity of these changes, but we need to say a little bit about what their impacts will be. We know that floods lead to fatalities and injuries, unfortunately, lead to severe property damage, as well as infrastructure damage, and droughts have its own, own um, categories of impact, severe impacts on water supply, irrigation supply, ecosystem impacts, and hydropower. That's the impact of climate on the occurrence of floods and droughts, which we have to take into account in any assessment of um, adaptation. But before I begin to talk about adaptation, I wanna make another point, And that is I've talked about the impact of climate change on water quantity, either too much water or too little water. But we are just beginning to realize, I say just beginning, there is quite a bit of research on this, but compared to the research on the um, impact of climate change on the quantity of water in the world, there's been a relatively small amount of research on its impact on water quality. Yet we know that climate change will have a significant impact. It will obviously increase and has already increased water temperatures, which will have a deleterious effect on aquatic e ecosystems in a variety of ways, as well as having secondary impacts on various water quality parameters, one of which I'm gonna tell you about in just a minute. Um, where less precipitation occurs, then you're, you will tend to have a lower dilution capacity for existing pollutants that enter rivers and lakes where more precipitation will occur. Yes, you might have greater dilution capacity, but you just can't win. You'll probably also have an increased urban pollution runoff, and you'll probably have more erosion from the riverbed and alongside the banks of the river um, because of this increased precipitation and higher river discharges. Now, one impact of climate change on water quality of I consider a very important concern is its impact on dissolved oxygen. Now dissolved oxygen is one of the basic requirements of, of a large fraction of the total sum of aquatic fauna that live in our freshwater systems. And this oxygen enters all, it enters all um, freshwater systems, whether you're talking about ponds, bigger lakes, or rivers through the diffusion at the surface of the water body or through turbulence at the surface of the lake or the river. So there's a continuous supply from the atmosphere. Now the problem is that the solubility, the capacity of a river or a lake to take up, to, diffuse, to uh, take in this oxygen from the atmosphere is a very strong function of temperature. And as stream and lake temperatures increase because of the steady increase in temperature around the world, then we expect that the oxygen capacity in general of streams and lakes will decrease. Now, just one illustration of this, which I've taken from a river in Malaysia, shows, and this diagram shows on the y-axis, the amount of dissolved oxygen in the river at various points as a function of the river temperature and it's interesting, this diagram I found interesting um, with, with a, a statistical um, uh, ten, tendency diagram that's, uh, that's drawn in there. Um, 
it shows very strongly the relationship between dissolved, uh, between water temperatures as they increase and decreasing dissolved oxygen in this river and generally in rivers around the world. Now, how are we going to adapt to all of this? The message has been negative up to now, but we know full well that there's a lot of adaptation options. And I can present different lists and different categories. Just for, this is just a selection of the kind of adaptation measures broken down in this case, and according to the measures that will protect against floods and those that will protect against droughts. And these are well known. There's kinds of technical uh, measures that you can take. The traditional measures of building dams and levees, there's um, land use measures you can take by restricting the amount of buildings that are allowed to be constructed in the vicinity of rivers, for example. Or you can build early warning systems. Uh, Bob referred to the anticipation of, of disasters and how we're getting better at it. You can build early warning systems, both for floods, but you can also build it for droughts. And for droughts is also a similarly large measure of technical issues, economic issues. Um, economic measures, et cetera. Some of these measures, by the way, not all of them require large engineering departments, large governmental, governmental coordination or large corporations. Uh, some of them have to do with the household. For example, increasing the efficiency of water use and reducing our exposure to droughts and low flows that occur in water supply. But I would like to focus, even though I don't have time to focus on all of these important uh, measures, I would like to focus on just one category that's traditionally used both to as an adaptation measure against both floods, but also against droughts. And that is to build large dams. And they have, as you probably know already, a lot of benefits and costs. I'm just gonna talk about one case study, maybe a, a case study that's that's worth hearing about because it's so important and has affected so many people. And that is the Sarovar Dam in Gujarat in India. Now, this dam has provided benefits of flood protection, providing irrigation water supply, of providing new drinking water supply for thousands of villages um, in the vicinity of the dam. We're talking about a major dam here, of course. We're talking about a dam that's about 160 meters high and about a kilometer wide and that leads to a backup in its reservoir behind it of around 200 kilometers. So this is a serious big dam. So it provides these benefits, but it also has its impacts, especially on the um, part, well, I wouldn't say especially on the environment, but on the environment that upstream, it has submerged around 40,000 hectares of forest and other habitat. It has downstream, uh, because storage goes on through much of the year, it, through much of the year, there's only a small outflow below the dam and has drastically reduced a major river in India, the Narmada River, and lead to, led to the destruction of its river habitat. I would consider most importantly of all, it has displaced thousands of people, around 200,000 people, mostly poor, and led to a major social uh, movement against the construction of the dam that was unsuccessful. Large dams in general displace a lot of people. The Three Gorges Dam in China has displaced more than a million people. And one reference has estimated that the number of people globally that have been displaced since 1970 by large dams amounts to around 80 million people. So what's the message here? The message here is that for large dams, for levees, for various adaptation measures to combat the impacts of climate change uh, against the freshwater system, we need to look carefully at their benefits, weigh the benefits of one adaptation measure against the other, and not forget the environmental impacts, which I think we have a tradition of taking into account, but especially the social impacts of these adaptation options. Uh, maybe it's, it's been resolved up to now, but certainly in the beginning of my career, adaptation meant largely engineering solutions, maybe Bob would agree with me, without the consideration of the whole picture, both the whole environmental picture, but also the social picture. And that's certainly an important message that I have, is that in going forward with uh, adaptation measures, we need to take in, into account the whole picture. Now, as an option to large dams, some people believe that there are in fact options already. 
something called natural floodways is being proposed in many parts of the world, especially in Holland. So what is a natural floodway? They have a nice program in the Netherlands called Ramte voor de Rivieren, uh, Room for the Rivers program. Apologies to any Dutch people out there. So that is simply reserving, as shown in that, in that uh, photo there on the left, reserving part of the floodplain as a floodway for very extreme river discharges. So you're allowing room for these river discharges by removing the levees and moving them back, and you're reestablishing the connection, an important connection between the river and floodplain. And between floods, you're allowing different kinds of usage of the land. It's been found in Netherlands already to be effective in protecting the population. Uh, it avoids the maintenance um, of existing flood barriers by removing these flood barriers. It helps the river to partly reestablish its original course, uh, which um, re also reduces peak river discharges because the straightening of rivers is one reason why um, peak river discharges occur today. It has low, relatively low operational costs and it has major side benefits in reestablishing habitats and enhancing biodiversity in these areas. Now, we also have to be realistic about these in that if you are going to be reserving a large part of the floodplains, large rivers tend to have large populations alongside of them. So you will be interfering with urban, the use of the land for urban areas, perhaps for uh, agricultural areas. And I have to also say that this whole idea of natural floodways requires um, quite some scientific studies to analyze its effectiveness both theoretically and also with empirical data versus traditional barriers. Natural floodways are fitting in to a whole category of options, which Bob alluded to briefly, which I'll also allude to, and that is something called nature-based options, which are, we like to say they are inspired by nature, that they at least don't discount the value of natural processes to help us adapt to climate change. And they involve largely to rehabilitate natural ecosystems as in the reintroduction of natural floodplain areas and um, actually enhancing natural processes in artificial ecosystems like cities. So examples are these natural floodways I showed, urban green spaces, uh, managing aquifer recharge. They tend to be cheaper, they tend to have fewer negative impacts than conventional, and they tend to have these strong side benefits of conserving natural land, of restoring ecosystems and the benefits they bring, of enhancing biodiversity, providing access to nature for urban populations, and in some cases even reducing water pollutants in various ways. We have yet, I think, to build up the science. And so those of you young researchers out there, and those of you senior researchers that can influence our uh, research agenda, I really believe that we need to give a priority in researching the feasibility of all aspects of nature-based options right now. We need more evidence for their effectiveness. We need to assess the, the costs that are associated with them, for example, the large land costs and other costs of uh, nature-based options. So it's time for me to wrap up. Let me wrap up by saying, as I showed you in the big picture, it comes largely down to two main actors when we talk about climate change and its impact on the um, freshwater system in the world, precipitation and evapotranspiration. You've seen that as precipitation and evapotranspiration change, we're seeing a trend in a change in average runoff under climate change, where we tend to see an increase in average runoff in the high latitudes, a decrease in the dry topics, and some mixed trends elsewhere. We also are expecting major impacts, unfortunately, on the frequency of floods and droughts throughout the whole world, with maybe an increase in the risk to droughts in places like North America and the southern part of Africa and the large part of Eurasia, such that around two thirds of the world's population may be uh, at further risk to an increasing frequency of droughts. 
where in some parts of the world, there will be an increasing risk of floods, unfortunately, large parts of Latin America, Africa, East Asia, and elsewhere. And in some places like Brazil, West Africa, and Southeast Asia, they may actually, according to the models, may experience an increase in risk of both. And keep in mind that climate change affects not only the amount of water, but also its quality. But luckily, there's lots of options that are available to us, some traditional ones, less traditional ones like nature-based options, but mind the environmental and social impacts. And with regards to nature-based options, let's pursue them. Let's see how they can help, uh, because they can not only help us uh, against the impacts of climate change, both with regards to increased floods, but also increased droughts, but they can also provide major benefits with regards to nature conservation and the restoration of nature. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Joe. That was another fantastic and comprehensive lecture. Thanks so much. Over to you, Jen, for the Q&A. Um, and that. please, we, I already see quite a number of questions in the Q&A, so please use the Q&A box for your questions. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much, Joseph, for that presentation. We do have some questions coming in. So the first is from Vivian Gornitz. Why an increase in runoff in the Sahara with climate change? If it came up on the maps, um, well, many, many analyses don't actually show changes in the Sahara because of the the extreme sensitivity of uh, the Sahara, since there's such a, such a little amount of um, precipitation, that of course any small increase or small, yeah, any kind of small increase will show up in a rate of change, will show up in a relative change map. So I would say that uh, rather than me erasing the results from, from that map, um, I did show them because that's what the researchers show, but I wouldn't take them too seriously um, in the Sahara. I think in an area which is so arid as the Sahara and other parts of the world, we need much more careful regional models to look at how the changes will subtly change in the region. And right now there's, there's really not agreement on whether there's a tendency for an increase in the Sahara um, or a decrease. There, we're beginning to get information through time series. For example, in West Africa, both the arid and both the semi-arid and the more humid parts of West Africa, we're beginning to see a signal now in um, an increasing precipitation patterns. Okay, thank you. And then the next question says, to what specific reasons do you attribute the elevated flood levels project in South America and China? Um, I'm not, didn't quite get that. Um, I, it doesn't have a name associated with the question, okay. but- Just um, to repeat the question. It, it says, to what specific reasons do you attribute the elevated flood levels project in South America and China? Okay, so perhaps they're referring, uh, perhaps the map showed that parts of Latin America and China are showing an increase in flood frequency. Yes. Well, almost certainly it has to do with the climate scenario and the increase in precipitation in the climate scenario, which is partly compensated by the increase in evaporation and transpiration coming from warmer temperatures in those regions, but not exactly. So the, in, the effect of increasing precipitation in those areas is exceeding the effect of increased evaporation and transpiration in those areas. Okay, and then we have someone asking, how possible is it to redistribute water from flooded areas to areas experiencing drought? It's not easy at all. Because unfortunately, you know, river systems in the world are divided into watersheds or catchments or other words that we give to them um, because the topography of the earth leads to the effect that precipitation in one part of an area tends to converge on a river in that area. 
What it means is that it takes a lot of energy to pump water from one catchment to another catchment. You have to get it over, or it could be a very high elevation. So it requires a lot of energy. So certainly technology has done amazing things in the future. And maybe if we finally have very efficient renewable energy, we will have enough energy to pump water from one catchment to the other. But I would say in the short term, let's watch out. Let's use our renewable energy to draw down our fossil fuels, which we, we have to do very urgently right now, rather than come up with new purposes for it to pump water from one catchment to the other. But I think you can have a different point of view. That's really a personal point of view. So row S looks like there's two questions in here. Um, says Professor Alcamo, nice talk. In your runoff slide, why is there not increased runoff shown for ice-laden Greenland and Antarctica, given that warmer temps causing rain precipitation has been shown to increase ice melting, leading to increased runoff? Part two of that is what mitigation and adaptation efforts can be done about low oxygen content in warmer lakes and rivers? So two separate questions, I guess. The second one was what can be- What mitigation and adaptation efforts can be done about low oxygen yeah, content? Lakes. Right. So the first one, sorry, but you would really have to examine the climate models and how they're operating to come up with an explanation for not seeing an increase in precipitation. But let me add, let me put it this way. Because of the effect that you mentioned, because of the increasing temperatures overall in the world, we are increasing overall the amount of evapo uh, evaporation, especially in the world. And there is more moisture going into the atmosphere. We're calling that, we, we say that we're actually accelerating the, the global water cycle in that way. That being said, how this moisture will be distributed around the earth really depends on regional and local circulation patterns, both ocean circulation patterns, but especially atmospheric circulation patterns and the topography of the continents vis-a-vis -vis the seas. So for a variety of numerous different factors interacting with each other, there will be differential rainfall in some places and actually a decreasing in rainfall in others. Overall, on the average, we expect increased precipitation because of this effect of greater evapotranspiration. As far as the warmer lakes and rivers, you know, you're hitting on it. I have to say, I would, I believe that overall, there's a very small amount of research on how to mitigate the impacts of climate change on water quality altogether. Um, one way we can mitigate it is that right now through our power plants, our fossil fuel power plants, we are artificially elevating the temperatures of streams uh, in the vicinity of the power plants, depending on how large they are. It could be one to several degrees in their vicinity. So we could mitigate those point sources of warm temperature discharges um, that we're already putting into rivers. But otherwise, I have honestly not seen um, any convincing research uh, that says how we can mitigate an entire river system or entire lake system against its increasing temperatures. I suppose once the engineers, um, I, I, not saying engineers negatively. In fact, I have an engineering degree. Uh, once the engineers come around to it, they may propose uh, pumping up cold groundwater into small rivers in order to compensate for the warmer temperatures that occur in summer because of the overall um, more higher frequency of heat waves in the summer or whatever. Uh, but right now, I have not seen any uh, good research on that topic. So go out and do it. Okay, so the next question uh, is from Nataraha Subash and asks, as far as agriculture is concerned, 
Due to increase in uncertainty under climate change, there is high impact on productivity. How these adaptation strategies will reduce the risk. So once again, what's the first part of that? As far as agriculture is concerned, due to increase in uncertainty under climate change, there is high impact on productivity. So asking uh, how will adaptation strategies reduce this risk okay. on the well, productivity? One, way, one thing that I want to mention, I mentioned in passing, but I noticed that Bob also mentioned it. And that is, we need to buy ourselves some time. We need to buy farmers some time. We need to buy um, um, city managers some time. We need to buy people living along rivers sometime by improving our capacity to provide early warning. There's a whole technology called early warning systems. There's quite a good system for predicting floods in Europe. I'm quite good, I should say. But then you had the situation where last year um, in a, an industrialized country like Germany was caught absolutely flat-footed by, by flooding that occurred there. Um, in Africa, there's the makings of a good early warning system for droughts and agriculture. So I think that one way to answer your question, to build in robustness, at least in the short term, to build in more confidence for farmers and for people in general, is to increase the early warning. That, that, that will not necessarily, so that will buy us some time at least in the short term, to prepare for a drought or a flood. But as we saw in Germany last year, it was interesting. You know, the prediction of the flood was pretty good, but it wasn't conveyed to the people that had to hear it. Um, I've been involved in, a, in projects in both South India and in Kenya, in which colleagues of mine are trying to improve the meteorological forecasts, on one hand to the farmers poor farmers in Kenya, and on the other hand, to Fisher in South India, in Kerala, because the meteorological forecasts for extreme climate events are simply not getting through to them. So on one hand, we need to improve early warning systems, the technology, the modeling, the technical aspect. On the other hand, we need to make them much more people-oriented, much more effective in conveying warnings to buy farmers, to buy planners, to buy people that live near rivers, time to anticipate an extreme climate event. These in the long term are not a solution, but as I said, it's a way of buying us some time. Okay, so we have time for uh, one last question, then we'll be moving into the discussion. So there'll be uh, more question and answers. Uh, Vivian Gornitz asks, uh, can you comment on the impacts of climate change, especially in regions of increasing drought on groundwater over extraction and growing needs of water for irrigation? Well, certainly there has been a body of research that are anticipating greater pressure on groundwater systems, simply because of a decrease in groundwater recharge, which will be occurring, uh, but then for the effect that you mentioned, and that is that as, um, um, as droughts occur and river flows, low flows occur more frequently in river supplies that people are relying on now for irrigation, then yes, there may be an increase and an overdraft of groundwater sources for irrigation. But however, there's some new research that's actually encouraging, and that is a, a body of research carried out in Africa uh, through a good part of Central and Eastern Africa has found that groundwater, that aquifers are recharged um, disproportionately by extreme climate by extreme rainfall events, okay? Which means that things like artificial groundwater recharge in which you route the temporary runoff that occurs in semi-arid regions when they have their occasional rainfall event, if you route that towards permeable areas, permeable soil areas that can soak up a lot of water quite rapidly, 
you can actually enhance your aquifers as a, as a backup during low flow periods, during dry periods, okay? So you use the opportunity of the occasional, but fairly regular high rainfall period that, that occurs every few times during the course of a year in a semi-arid region. And through routing this river through artificial means, you can recharge groundwater areas and they can serve as a reservoir during lower flow periods. Okay, great. So those are all the questions. Um, so we will, I'll hand it off to Manishka for the discussion. Great. Thank you, Jen. Those were fantastic questions. And thank you, Joe, uh, for answering all of them. We had a total of 16 questions and managed to answer them all. So that's great. So we will now um, stop sharing the screen and move to gallery view so that we can get uh, all the speakers uh, joining us. Um, sometimes we have um, authors from the book joining us as well. But I believe today we have um, Joe and Robert for this next section. Um, so really what we want to discuss here, and I, you know, you've captured some of this in, in your talks and in the Q&A is looking at the bigger picture and you know, having a discussion about where next for impacts uh, and adaptation. So the first question I have uh, for you both is, what are the biggest barriers we need to overcome for each of your sectors? to effectively address uh, climate change impacts. Uh, so we will start with that. We'll see how much time we have. Um, and uh, you know, we have a few more questions. We may not get to that. And if people have questions about sort of this uh, discussion topic, please go to the Q&A, but we can't promise we'll be able to get to them. Or thank you. Uh, Joe, let's start with you. Well, I'd say three. I'd say financing, lack of engagement, and wars, pandemics, and other distractions. That's what I'd say the three big barriers are. Financing, it's going to be a political decision. Uh, the more urgent it becomes, the, the, um, the more leverage the countries that need the financing will have, I believe, um, but it's incredibly complex. You have to keep in mind that what's happening on the climate front, if you go to a climate negotiations, I was always fascinated. The first few times I attended the climate negotiations as a scientist or as an advisor, I just couldn't understand what's go what was going on, right? And then finally, you know, after talking to a lot of people and a lot of the negotiators, um, they made it clear to me that what happens in negotiations, what happens in financing for climate change, for example, is just one factor in a whole complex of factors, of political factors going on in the world. It might be tied to a, um, a foreign aid agreement. It may be tied to a military agreement. It may be tied um, to a sports agreement, nevertheless, but it's not clear. So as the politics evolves, hopefully the financing also will um, show up for adaptation. It's certainly a barrier now, the lack of financing. Engagement, I think still most people in power have not come around to the fact that the only successful adaptation measure is one that whose planning and implementation involves those people being affected. Um, and now with the trend of authoritarianism in the world, frankly, um, I don't think we're making a whole lot of progress. I think if anything, politicians are believing they could be more autocratic about and less uh, participatory about their things. And then of course we have the distractions, but nevertheless, it takes people like, um, that are attending this call to stick with it. And um, yes, there's a lot in the world we can't do something about, but probably people on this call um, want to and can do something about adaptation to climate change. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, Bob, over to you. Thank you. Um, well, I'd agree with everything that Joe said, actually. They could all be applied to the coast. So that's uh, and the issues I was talking about. So I'll build on that. And I, well, one thing that springs to mind immediately is this need to take a long-term view. I said that, but if you look in many places in the world, 
Um, people take a really short time scale view, maybe 10, 20 years and beyond that are not really thinking. And, and I think that basically, given the fact that, you know, particularly on the coast, sea level is going to keep on rising. You, you've really got to take that long term view to see where you're going and recognize that your children, your grandchildren will live in a different world in, the co in, in coastal terms and be ready to prepare for that. So I think that, that and that's a, but that's a big that's a big change. In, in thinking, um, but I think we really need to encourage that because that's how you find the solutions that really will work. Um, and, but, and everything that Joe said then will be relevant in, in terms of how to find, find those solutions. Um, and I think, um, and, and I think this, this idea of nature-based is quite, quite important because um, I fully support everything Joe said about nature-based solutions, but also their limits, because I think at times some people get a bit romantic about them and sort of assume they can do everything. I think it's really important to understand what we can do feasibly with nature and also recognize that probably in cities like New York or London, there are going to be limits. Nature needs space. And in cities, we haven't got space, which is often the reason nature's sort of been destroyed in cities. And so we have to recognize there are compromises and trade-offs that are quite important and probably go beyond climate. They go, but they go to all environmental management, I think, really. Thank you. Um, I think we can wrap up soon. Um, so I'm actually going to give you both an opportunity to use the last couple of minutes to um, either add more to sort of this bigger discussion on where next for impacts um, and adaptation, or you know, to briefly mention anything that you didn't get a chance to address during your talks. Well, if I go first, I mean, I just. I just like to, it's maybe, it's probably reinforcing I think but the, the but I think probably I didn't emphasize it enough is this the need for thinking about these adaptation pathways so I'm saying the same point maybe I just said a moment ago but but I really do think um that's quite a big change in thinking you know it's maybe revolutionary almost in some ways and that people often think about they got once they're going to do one thing and then the problem solved and in a way the fact that we're going to be managing this problem through my life my children's life and on and we have to and I think that that and by recognizing that I think we actually will make quite different decisions and end up potentially in much better places but we have to sort of grasp that nettle now. Um, and I think that's probably a challenge for a lot of our, a lot of our uh, sort of institutions learning by doing. It almost means that you have to accept you might make mistakes. And, um, you know, people always want success, don't they? We live in a world that wants success. So um, how do we, uh, learning implies maybe things not going quite perfectly. So that, that's a challenge, I think, for our institutional systems. Thank you. That's a really important uh, point. Uh, Joe, over to you. Oh, Joe, you're on mute. So there's two points I'd like to make at the end. One is consistent with Bob's important note that we need a long-term view. In looking about adaptation, we should think not only about equipment, and walls and bricks and mortar, but we should think about landscapes. So it's closely related to the nature-based idea, but we need to think about reintroducing our floodplains, but even in cities, and I agree with Bob that this is gonna be really tough to open up um, the east side of Manhattan as a, as a floodway uh, in the future, but who knows? Um, but what you could do, is you could, be, you could support the greening of cities because cities are constantly renewing themselves. And as climate adaptation hopefully becomes a priority, even in cities, as neighborhoods are transformed, they could be transformed in a more green way. And um, urban green spaces, already there's, there's a body of research on that, uh, depending on the size of the green space, they can make a significant impact on the rainfall that's absorbed in that area and a contribution to uh, flooding. So you could already, make, in a short term, make, uh, in, 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 uh, make an impact on uh, the impacts of climate. So 
landscapes. Let's think in terms of short and long term, in terms of transforming our landscapes so that we adapt to climate change and make them more beautiful and make them more uh, biodiverse. Secondly, adaptation to an extent begins at home. One of the most effective ways we can adapt to uh, the, the increased risk of drought in the future is to lower our vulnerability, to lower our demands on a certain amount of water, on reducing household water use through various efficiency improvements. Now, we've made, we've made a lot of progress on that in the last 10 or 20 years, but we have a long way to go. So my second message is, be, apart from think in the short and long term, transform our landscapes, let's look at our households and neighborhoods and communities and how we can reduce our exposure to future droughts by improving water use efficiency. Thank you, Bob Renjo, uh, for both your lectures and for answering all the questions and participating in the discussion. Uh, so we're just now entering the last few minutes of the webinar. So over to Jen, she'll share her screen and we'll share some um, resources and tell you a little bit about uh, the upcoming webinars. Okay, so we wanted to share um, a few resources to complement today's lectures. The first um, is the NASA Sea Level site. So on here, there's various tools um, from data analysis, publications, and multimedia resources. Uh, so then the second is the Rising Waters site. Um, so on here, you can explore um, the impacts, causes, and future of sea level rise and how NASA is monitoring the changes um, with some graphs, images, and also videos to explore. And then third, uh, we have the precipitation education. So this has lesson plans um, that's broken down by grade level um, from kindergarten through 12. Uh, so a great educational resource. Great, thanks so much. And we'll uh, put some of those links in the chat as well. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide. So the rec webinar recordings are available at the NOAA CC Run website. Uh, we plan to have uh, these lectures up within the next couple of weeks as well. Uh, on to the next slide. So once again, this is the book that this webinar series is based off of, and you can use uh, this code here to get 30% off. Uh, and to the next. Um, Jenny, when you get a chance, uh, there's a request for the links uh, to the NASA resources when you can. Yes. So on April 27th, we have uh, William Travis from the University of Colorado, uh, and he'll be talking about margins of agriculture and settlement. And then we'll keep all of you um, posted on um, the future webinars. We have... Um, the mailing list, so we'll send it across through that. And when you register for one, you can also register for multiple. So um, that's one option too. So I want to wrap up by thanking our two wonderful speakers and for the audience for joining us and spending the past two hours with us. The objective of the book and the webinar series is to reach students, teachers, professionals, and all interested people in climate change uh, ideally across the world. And we're especially you know, interested in increasing participation in reg from regions with limited resources. And that's part of the reason why we uh, have them uh, recorded and up so that it can be accessed anytime. So we really hope that these resources will help advance climate change education across the world. Thank you for your participation and see you all in two weeks. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert and Joseph. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. It was Bye, fun. Everyone. Thank you. Stay well, huh? Thank you Thank very you. Thanks very much. Enjoyed it. Bye. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you.